Hello everybody, NeuroGal here, and I am so excited because today I get to speak with famous neuropsychologist Dr. Elkanon Goldberg about his new book, Creativity, the Human Brain in the Age of Innovation. Dr. Goldberg is in internationally renowned for his work in cognitive neuroscience and is a author, neuroscientist, educator, and clinician, and currently a clinical professor at New York University School of Medicine. He also just happened to be a student and close associate of the great neuroscientist Alexandra Luria. In his book, Dr. Goldberg describes the nature of human creativity and uncovers the brain processes behind it. He also touches on how culture and evolution have contributed to human creativity. So without further ado, let's move on to the interview with the inspiring author of Creativity, the Human Brain in the Age of Innovation with Dr. Elkanon Goldberg. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg, for joining us. So you are the author of one of my new favorite books called Creativity, the Human Brain in the Age of Innovation. Just for my audience, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? The pleasure. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist and a cognitive neuroscientist. I'm on the faculty of NYU School of Medicine and a clinical professor of neurology there. And uh, I do clinical work. I have a, a, a clinical practice in neuropsychology. I do research in cognitive neuroscience. I collaborate with people worldwide. When I teach, I do a fair amount of post, postdoctoral, postgraduate teaching. And uh, I write books occasionally. That's right. And you've written two other very successful books. Uh, the first one was called The New Executive Brain, or The Executive Brain. It was, the, 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 it was not the first one. The first one was Executive Brain, okay. which was published, I think, in 2001. And there was a book titled The Wisdom Paradox, published, I think, in 2005, a paperback came out in 2006. And there was New Executive Brain, published in 2009 which was initially intended as a second edition of the executive brain, but it ended up being such, such a considerable expansion of books and that, uh, that uh, it really became a new uh, separate book, a different book. Mm -hmm. And now we have creativity. Right. And I, re I really appreciated this book because despite being a neurologist, I've, I've learned quite a bit about the neuroscience behind creativity. You discuss uh, two major parts of the brain that are that play a big role in creativity: the the frontal lobes and the right hemisphere. Can you talk a little bit about the frontal lobes and their role in creativity? Right. Well, the frontal lobes uh, is one of the most mysterious, or at least it was one of the most mysterious uh, parts of the brain, and it took neuroscientists and neuropsychologists many decades to come to recognize and appreciate it, its importance. I mean, and, uh, until the, sometime in the second half of the 20th century, the dominant point of view was that it was basically useless, that it was uh, uh, sitting there for some mysterious purposes, not doing any, not contributing, making any discernible contribution. And, uh, and it was only in the, you know, with the work uh, by, by mentor Alexander Lurie and other people, Carl Primer in this country, and uh, Alexander Lurie in Russia, uh, that uh, there was a change in the zeitgeist, and uh, people came to realize that in addition to uh, the various parts of the brain in charge of very specific cognitive functions, there is a part of the brain, there are some brain structures which are not so much in charge of any specific skills, but whose function is akin to that of the central executive officer of the corporation, or akin to the function of orchestra conductor. So they sort of coordinate and direct the contributions of other parts of the brain, okay? And uh, so as long as neuroscience and cognitive science, well, we can go to neuropsychology, uh, were uh, focused, they're focused on trying to understand the brain mechanisms of specific skills, reading, writing, walking, talking, you know, 
prefrontal cortex was not necessarily the picture because <coughs> sorry yes. and because a patient would have significant damage to the prefrontal cortex yet these isolated skills remained intact okay and we took the field many years to recognize that there is this different higher order stratum of cognitive control as I said earlier, akin to what the conductor does for the orchestra, mm -hmm. which, uh, the, and uh, this conductor resides in the prefrontal cortex, okay? Mm -hmm. And you talk oh. about, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's it. So you talk, uh, in regards to the frontal lobe and the frontal cortex, um, you talk about hypofrontality and hyperfrontality. How does this relate to creativity? Well, it's a very interesting question. Uh, the brain of a healthy individual, neurological and psychiatrical healthy individual, uh, who is awake, is characterized by the predominance of hyperfrontality. What do we mean by that? We mean that the prefrontal cortex is physiologically more active than other parts of the brain. We see it in the EEG. Uh, whereby this higher frequency, lower amplitudes, or either is like beta frequency, is more kind of a pronounced in the prefrontal cortex than in the posterior brain, which has been demonstrated with positive attribution tomography. Glucose metabolism is more active uh, in the prefrontal cortex than in other parts of the brain, in the weak, healthy individual, etc., etc. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, there are states, even the normal people, the healthy people, work, which are characterized by hypofrontality. So the prefrontal cortex is physiologically less active. It's rather than sleep. It's probably hypnosis. It may be a state of kind of an exercise high, you know, and I'm saying rather high, and states like that, that has been kind of suggested. Uh, the, it is trance-like states. Uh, I personally am very interested in, uh, we are starting all kinds of uh, this, uh, research projects in Southeast Asia under the rubric of what I like to refer to as cross-cultural cognitive neuroscience. And uh, I am very interested in these, these states of deep trance, which are you know, part of some of the Eastern cultures, okay? And, uh, and uh, uh, I would imagine why am I interested in that? Uh, not so much because I'm interested in these trans like states in and of itself, even though they are fascinating, but because I think that they offer a very interesting window into our into the research into the mechanisms of consciousness. Okay, because consciousness, of course, is a very big topic in neuroscience. How do people study consciousness? They look at comatose patients. They look at at patients under anesthesia, but these are patients, these are, you know, and, uh, you know and, uh, coma implied that there is significant brain damage, brain dis dysfunction, maybe transient, but there is some brain dysfunction, okay? Deep anesthesia also, and, uh, you know, a deep anesthesia is not given to, to healthy people, it's given to people who, you know, so require surgery for some you know, serious condition, okay? Uh, whereas deep trance can be studied in, you know, in Southeast Asia, particularly in Indonesia is the country where we are beginning to, uh, to do, try to develop this research. Uh, it's part of their culture. There are certain rituals in Java, in Bali, where people, just not even professional performers, but just regular villagers in some, you know, local villages, and uh, uh, go into this, immerse uh, uh, themselves, or uh, so, so kind of a, uh, 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 rituals, into states of deep trance, and then they come out of this trance and go back to their every, uh, everyday activity. So I find this very interesting as a, a potentially, as a window into the mechanism of consciousness, because these people are neurologically fine, they are not patients. You see what I'm saying? Right. So you don't have to worry about you know their brains already being altered by their underlying disease. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but I I don't know that for a fact because these studies, to, uh, to my knowledge, have not been conducted. But with any luck, we will be able to conduct this is the intent to conduct these studies. And my prediction is that uh, uh, that, that these states are characterized by uh, the 
by hypofertility. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so psychiatric conditions uh, and neurological conditions are characterized by hypofertility. We know that in endogenous depression, for instance, there is a relative reduction of physiological activity in the frontal lobes. Okay? We know that in TBI, kind of patients suffering from long term effects of traumatic brain injury, we have reduction of activity in the prefrontal cortex. Okay? So, uh, the, uh, now in the, so uh, this whole issue of hypofrontality and hypofrontality is interesting in many contexts. In the context of creativity, you know, when people talk about creativity, there is, it's sort of understood that a creative process, that the creative process is usually a process. This kind of, this whole notion, uh, the, this tabloid notion, uh, that, you know, there may be some total belief who didn't put any effort into anything, has some kind of a miraculous aha moment, and uh, discover, discover the universe, okay? Well, that's kind of a tabloid nonsense. It does not happen, okay? Uh, and, uh, in, in the overwhelming majority of cases, any kind of a consequentially creative output, output, whether it's a scientific discovery or kind of a introduction of a new scientific concept or, uh, or some kind of artistic product, is a result of a, of, a, of a long process, okay? It's been culminated, this kind of a epiphany, this aha moment. But this aha moment does not happen unless it is preceded by a long period of hard work. Mm -hmm. And that's what many creative uh, people have noted, like Albert Einstein. I mean, there were a number of you know, people of supreme creativity who tried to understand, and uh, to introspect the nature of these creative processes in themselves. Einstein was one of them, but he, has act he actually wrote some uh, letters where he tried to kind of uh, capture to introspection, uh, this creative process. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, all these people kind of uh, refer to this peculiar relationship between kind of a focused concentration, which takes time, and then these kind of moments of epiphany, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the, so there are some reasons to believe that this focused concentration requires hyperfrontality, occur, uh, and of course, in hyperfrontal states. But these aha moments, and this kind of a, what people refer to as mental wandering, something that precedes the aha moment, mm -hmm. uh, where the, uh, the individual seems not even to be in control of one's own mental process, okay, uh, seem to be associated with hypofrontal states, okay? Like Bob Dylan, uh, the, uh, was asked about the nature of his creative processes. You know who he is, Bob Dylan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he said, he said, well, it happens by itself. And they just, and he was asked, well, how do you come up with these brilliant songs of yours? He said, well, it just happens. And I'm just lucky to be in the room when it, when it happens, okay? Yeah. But, yes, that may have been his introspective sense, but I would imagine, I'm quite certain, that these moments were, these experiences were kind of endpoints of, of some very laborious and probably conscious, I'm sure, conscious processes, where he was thinking about his music and, you know, uh, which were effortful, okay? So this introspection, that, you know, it happens by itself and he, he just happens, he's lucky enough to be in the room when it happens. Uh, it kept, probably captured this hypofrontal state. But I'm pretty sure, you know, I, uh, uh, that uh, in him, as in many, as in any other kind of a consequentially creative individual, these hypofrontal states are interspersed with hyperfrontal states, which correspond to uh, 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 correspond to this uh, effortful part of the creative process. So basically it's about uh, inspiration, perspiration and insp inspiration. You see what I'm saying? There is no inspiration without perspiration. Exactly. And the inspiration seems to be involve hyperfrontal states and it's inspiration may be hyperfrontal states, okay? So, and what is not 
either one by itself does not seem to do the job. You need this complex kind of interplay between the two. Okay. And it, it sort of reminds me of the description of the, the flow process. Um, when someone is uh, involved in the flow state, um, whether it's an artist or a musician, they have to have that underlying experience that I assume is, uh, is a result of hyperfrontality. Flow process does not happen to you, the rabbis. It does not happen to kind of a, uh, blessed beliefs uh, without any grounding in, in, in the field. Mm-hmm. It happens to people with very serious and firm grounding in the field. Mm-hmm. So moving on to um, the other region of the brain that you describe in your your creativity book, the right hemisphere, um, you you say that it has a lot to do with the creative process. And I know there's been a lot of mythology surrounding the right and the left hemispheres. Can you describe that a little bit? Well, uh, if you think about the history of neuropsychology, uh, there is somewhat misguided terminology uh, referring to the left hemisphere and the dominant hemisphere, and the right hemisphere and this non-dominant hemisphere, or sub-dominant hemisphere, which implies that, you know, in traditional classic neuropsychology, people sort of were not sure what to do with this right hemisphere, okay? The functions of the right hemisphere were much easy, uh, much more available to reveal themselves to scientists. The functions of the right and of the left hemisphere. The functions of the right hemisphere were harder to crack, and uh, so there was this notion that it's less valuable, that it's less useful. Okay. Now in neurology, there was this in neurosurgery, there was this assumption that you have to tread very carefully operating on the left hemisphere. Right. With the right hemisphere, you could take more liberties. Mm-hmm. You see what I say? Mm-hmm. Think of the WADA test, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, where they injected sodium amidal in one carotid and the other carotid. It gave little tests basically to map, in the course of these 15 minutes, to map uh, the brain mechanisms of, of the language. Okay? So the important thing was uh, the, to protect language and not to uh, kind of mess up the neurosurgical interventions, parts of the brain in charge of language. Other parts of the brain were deemed to be less important, okay? So uh, there was a notion linking the left hemisphere to language and the right hemisphere to non-verbal processes, more specifically visual spatial processes, okay? Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Maybe because the, the right hemisphere was so mysterious, and not so much in serious neuropsychology, and more so in kind of a popular literature, the bordering of kind of a tabloid literature, mm-hmm. this notion uh, the, the, was promoted that the right hemisphere would be the seat of creativity, of intuition, of all these good things. Okay? Mm-hmm. Well, that's an oversimplification. But what is not an oversimplification is that the right hemisphere does seem to be particularly important in, kind of a, uh, the, in situations where the organism of the human being is confronted with a double situation, with kind of a double cognitive challenges which do not resonate with anything that had been ex- with prior experience or knowledge, or previously acquired knowledge. Okay? Mm-hmm. So many of our cognitive processes are driven by really previously acquired knowledge and cognitive routines and strategies, each of us has a vast repertoire of those. But you know, but once in a while, or maybe not even so uh, infrequently, we encounter situations which are totally novel. And this is when the right hemisphere appears to be very important. And just as an interesting thought, I talk about it in my book, this exposure, the rate of exposure to novelty is increasing incrementally because our society, uh, you know, even a few generations ago, maybe even two generations ago, society was pretty static. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And the accumulation of knowledge was not that steep. This curve can which characterize the accumulation of new knowledge in society was not that steep. You could learn, you know, basically acquire a base of knowledge in your youth, and you could coast on it the rest of your life, okay? And, uh, you know, a 19th century doctor 
probably, you know, I don't have old, but I don't that old. I don't of the 19th century. But I imagine that the 19th century doctor could learn and acquire his medical skills as a young person, and then basically coast on these skills the rest of his life or her life. Because the rate of kind of a accumulation of new knowledge was not that steep. Mm-hmm. It's not always the case, okay? Today, you, you know, you uh, look up at, at the old people, uh, like myself, at the, at the using computer, using the internet, this is what we are doing this very moment, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. The, uh, manipulating all kinds of uh, uh, the, uh, portable electronic devices, uh, uh, handheld devices. We did not grow up with this stuff. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I personally encountered computers, computers entered my life when I was well into my middle age. And internet even later. Yeah. So, and uh, handheld devices like cell phones, etc., even later, okay? Yeah. So, and, and we're constantly, ex- so the rate with which even the regular human being is exposed to new knowledge and is forced by society whether he or she likes it or not to acquire new skills is uh, increasing exponentially. And that implies that the role, the relative roles of the two hemispheres may change. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That there's less and less reason to refer to the left, to the right hemisphere and the non-dominant hemisphere. Mm-hmm. In the rapidly changing environment, it may become even more important than it was in these kind of earlier aesthetic environments. Absolutely. And you bring up a good point, and you talk a, a little bit about this in your book as well. Um, how, do you, how does that uh, relate to the incidence of dementia um, currently as opposed to the past? Well, what we encounter recently is a very, you know, basically encouraging phenomenon and to the best of my knowledge, totally unexpected. Namely, basically the society was prepared to deal with the increased burden of dementia in society. Okay? Why? Because people live longer. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the remain in this kind of a physically relatively healthy much longer. At the same time, the cure for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias are not around the corner. We will find them eventually, but they are not around the corner. They will not be available this year or even next year. It will take longer, okay? So because of that, the expectation was that the, the, uh, that the number of people with dementia will increase in society, right? Mm-hmm. This is kind of a, not only a medical problem, it's also a socioeconomic problem, right? But what began to happen relatively recently is that incidence of dementia was beginning to cut down. No prevalence. The, the, you know, the, your, uh, the audience must understand the difference between prevalence and incidence. Prevalence of a condition is how many cases of people with this condition are there in, in, in the total population. Incidence is the rate at which new cases show up, right? So it turned out that incidence of dementia was coming down, basically, both in this country and in several European countries, in the United Kingdom, in Germany, in the Netherlands. So I don't think that it was an expected phenomenon. It was certainly not expected by me. But uh, there were some reports coming from various very kind of uh, uh, reputable institutions like uh, I think that there was a study like that at Duke University, one of the best universities in the country, except for some uh, in Europe from Karolinska Institute at the uh, very important uh, the university, medical university in Sweden, etc., etc. So it appears that the, uh, the, uh, at this point there, is a, there have been multiple documentations of this phenomenon. Why? Nobody understands. Okay? When people, well, one could say, because you know, medicine improves, and uh, that people remain physically uh, healthier, and various risk factors for dementia are better at all, like diabetes, like maybe some, something else. But uh, when uh, the researchers try to control for these 
kind of obvious factors, it turned out that they do not explain this phenomenon fully. So there has to be something else. So has to be identified factor X, you know, which we don't understand, which contributes to this drop in the incidence. So uh, what does that be? Uh, for instance, that dementia develops at a later age. So if somebody, you know, de eventually develops dementia, then instead of developing it at a certain age, and, uh, now people tend to develop it maybe three or four or five years later. Mm -hmm. See? That's a huge game, etc., etc. Um, and I speculate, it's strictly a conjecture, and uh, I guess it's my kind of a hypothesis, and I don't want to present it as a fact. It's not a fact, it's just a hypothesis. But I think that this is a result of increasing exposure to novelty. So the brain is challenged, uh, challenged more than it used to be challenged even two generations ago, maybe even one generation ago. And so this uh, use it or lose it mechanism operates in a more kind of a vigorous fashion. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. This uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, increased demands uh, on the brain basically serve a certain neuroprotective factor. Mm -hmm. And the right uh, hemisphere and allows it. Serves as a, a protective factor against various medical conditions. Mm -hmm. And with the cognitive activity serves as a protective factor. And, you know, there is no magic. Eventually, you know, we all and, uh, come to an end, okay? So one should not overstate, again, in, in kind of in the tabloid world, people latch on to, uh, uh, to some uh, uh, discoveries and, uh, uh, and trivialize them and kind of, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, 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 all kinds of a loose talk begins to surround them. Neuroplasticity mm. actually suffered this kind of a fate, okay? So now we hear all kind of a, uh, a tabloid rant about neuroplasticity overstating it. But it is a real phenomenon. Even if you strip it of all this overstatement of exaggeration and tabloid fluff, it is a real phenomenon. And uh, uh, this neuroplasticity is activity driven. So uh, by, by an increased exposure to novelty, uh, the human beings are benefit from the effects of neuroplasticity more, neuroplasticity more and uh, it exerts a certain extent of protective effect. And this is one possible explanation, which I advance in my book. Yeah, and, and one could hypothesize that the, the right hemisphere has a lot to do with that because it's yeah. taking in a yeah. lot of novel yeah. information. Yeah. And the frontal lobes. Mm -hmm. Because the right hemisphere is critical for dealing with novelty, and so, do the front, so are the frontal lobes. Absolutely. Well, well that, that's perfect. I, I know we're out of time, but I highly recommend Dr. Goldberg's book to anybody who's interested in learning more about the neuroscience of creativity. Again, the book is Creativity, the Human Brain in the Age of Innovation. And Dr. Goldberg also has written two other books, The Wisdom Paradox and The New Executive Brain, which are on my top of my reading list. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. Bye-bye.